Increased lean, lean red meat does, intake does not elevate markers of oxidative stress and inflammation in humans. I mean, you can see it in the title. I'm not sure what else we need to say other than mm -hmm. that this is interventional data, right? This is not epidemiology. This is interventional data. And this was an interventional study done over the course of six weeks. With, it's eight weeks, 60 participants. And what happened in this study, this was so fascinating. They ate an extra half pound of meat per day replacing carbohydrates. So this is, this is like a carnivore-ish trend. Maybe that's a little too much to say, but they're increasing red meat, decreasing plant foods. And at the end of eight weeks, what happens? They said relative to control, red meat resulted in higher protein uh, percent of energy, lower carbohydrate percentage energy, higher iron intakes, and lower F2 isoprostane excretion, lower leukocyte counts, and trends for lower C-reactive protein concentrations. Okay, so F2 isoprostane is a marker of oxidative stress. It's measured relative to creatinine, and it's telling us if meat is causing oxidative stress. Later in the uh, podcast, James tries to just uh, uh, say something as if it's fact. See, meat causes inflammation, but there really are not good studies to suggest that meat causes inflammation. This is not true. Um, there are many studies to suggest this is in fact not the case in any way, shape, or form, including this one and many others. So let's just go over a few studies that corroborate the idea that animal foods are not inflammatory. And these are interventional studies, and I would challenge James to rebut any of this. One of the things, if I pause here for a moment, that I should have said at the beginning was that we invited James on this podcast. Oh yeah, we tried. I we invited him here. It's not fair to do this to somebody, to debunk the debunk of the debunk, but James has been invited to this podcast, so you were invited to the party, man. Um, so I just wanna go over a few studies that we'll note on the screen um, that, that I would say enforce the point that meat is not inflammatory. The first one is called Effects of Plant and Animal High-Protein Diets on Immune Inflammatory Biomarkers, a six-week intervention trial. In this trial, they had 37 participants and they gave one group a diet that was high in plant protein and another group a diet that was high in animal protein. Both groups had the same macros, which were 30% protein, 40% carbohydrates, and 30% fat. And at the end of six weeks, they looked at many markers. So they looked at pro-inflammatory adipokines, which are uh, chimerin and progranulin. They looked at cytokines, including TNF-alpha, IL-6, um, and others, which are esoteric, TGF-beta-1, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they looked at um, markers of gut inflammation, including calprotectin and other uh, inflammatory proteins, including lactoferrin and growth differentiation factor 15. Now, what do we think that showed at the end of this? Basically, um, they, they actually found that um, chimerin and progranulin concentrations decreased following both diets. TGF beta 1 increased in animal protein, decreased in plant protein, though that was not significant whereas calprotectin increased in plant protein and decreased in animal protein. That was also not significant, but it was much closer. And there were no statistically significant differences in the concentrations of interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, uh, SUPAR, which is the soluble urokinase-type plasminogen activator receptor, lactoferrin, GDF-15, could be seen in any of the other arms. So if you look at the data for this study, basically there were no significant differences between the two groups. In the animal protein group, there was a trend toward increased TGF-beta-1. In the plant protein group, there was a trend toward increased calprotectin, but neither of those were significant, and the rest of the markers were not different between them. So I feel like James' argument that meat is inflammatory is really not accurate. I will also note this other study at the risk, just add a few more here, mm -hmm. responses of inflammatory markers to a low fat, high carbohydrate diet, effects of energy intake. This is a fascinating study because they had, um, they had people who either could do a eucaloric phase that was high fat, excuse me, low fat, high carbohydrate, or they could do ad libitum feeding, which means they only ate as much as they wanted to relative to their previous meal. So in this study they had 22 postmenopausal women, and they looked at how many calories they were eating before the study, and they put them on a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet. And they looked to see what the inflammatory markers did. And if they kept the calories the same, 
then there were actually there then there were more inflammatory markers. So if they had the same amount of calories hmm. on a high carbohydrate diet, it was inflammatory, which is interesting. But in the ad libitum group, they did not have inflammatory markers go up, probably because they ate less food. So this kind of harkens back to what I was talking about with Stan Efforting. I think that in humans, we can either eat high carb or high fat and do well metabolically. If we try to combine high carb and high fat, we're probably going to run into problems because in the natural world, we don't often see high carb and high fat mm -hmm. together. Um, that's basically breast milk and nowhere else do we see high carb and high fat together. Mm -hmm. 